Live by the sword, die by the sword. It's a saying that's often used, but in the case of EA Sports NCAA football franchise, it fits perfectly. College football fans are known as some of the most passionate fans in existence, and the passion for the NCAA football franchise was no exception. So, how did a video gaming institution just simply disappear? This is the legend of NCAA football. It's the sound you've waited months to hear. Its images are some of your oldest memories. It's caused some of your greatest triumphs. And your biggest heartbreaks. This is college football. It's tradition, pageantry, and intensity. You can visit every school in the country and never see the same thing twice. It's the option at Georgia Tech, the pistol at Nevada, and the spread no huddle. It's Howard's Rock, the smoke in Miami, and every Saturday, you tap that sign. This is what makes college football special. This is why your school is more than who you root for. It's who you are. The wait is over. College football is here. In 1982, Apple's director of product marketing left his position and created a startup company. Trip Hawkins would be aided by members of Apple, Atari, and other high-profile Silicon Valley companies to form Electronic Arts, or EA for short. One of EA's main goals was to highlight game developers as artists, on the same level as rock stars. EA even shipped their games in fold-out album covers, complete with profiles of the game's developers inside. EA also wanted more traditional celebrities featured in their games. In 1983, EA released one-on-one -on -one Dr. J vs. Larry Bird, and it instantly made Electronic Arts a player in the gaming market, becoming EA's highest selling game for years to come. During this early time in the company's history, EA also released a football game called Touchdown Football. The game was slow and only featured six players on each team at one time. EA would later rectify that when they teamed up with Super Bowl winning coach John Madden. Madden refused to attach his name to anything that didn't resemble pro football, thus making Electronic Arts scramble to get 11 on 11 football working on then limited technology. It turned out that all the hard work and crunch time was worth it. Madden football, although going without the NFL license for several years, became a household name. EA had found the right connection between real life and video game football, and they wanted to continue to roll the success of John Madden into their next football franchise. Having professional football covered, it was time to move on to the college game. After a Hall of Fame coaching career in the NFL that saw him win three Super Bowl championships, Bill Walsh, who coached the Stanford Cardinals in the 1970s, was now back at Stanford. After winning a Pac-10 championship and a bowl game in his first year back in 1992, Walsh signed on to be the face of EA's first college football game. Bill Walsh College Football was released for the Sega Genesis and Sega CD in 1993 and for the Super Nintendo in early 94. The game, much like Madden Football, started without a license and featured 24 unlicensed then-current teams and 24 historical teams. The unlicensed teams resembled real-life schools, allowing EA to get around not having any of the college licenses in their pocket a tactic that would eventually lead to the series' downfall. The relationship with Coach Walsh wouldn't last much longer. In 1994, EA released Bill Walsh College Football 95 exclusively for the Sega Genesis console. At the time, EA preferred publishing games on the Genesis, as until late 91, the Genesis was a more powerful console over Nintendo's 8-bit NES system, leading to EA building a solid foundation on Sega's hardware. Not only that, EA was not pleased with Nintendo's tight restrictions for publishing games on their systems. 
For Bill Walsh 95, players could choose between a bowl series or a playoff system, with the bowls being unlicensed. The unlicensed teams from the year prior were gone and replaced with 36 licensed college football teams. Players, like most sports games of the time, were limited to a number. In 1995, with Bill Walsh now out of the picture, the series was rebranded as College Football USA and now featured all Division 1A teams. Players could now play in licensed bowl games at the end of the season or still opt for a playoff system. The next year, for College Football USA 97, the series made its return to the Super Nintendo. It was also the first entry in the series to promote and feature a former college football player on the cover with Nebraska's Tommy Frazier who is now a member of the College Football Hall of Fame and considered one of the top players in college football history. Frazier unfortunately went undrafted due to a blood clot in his leg from Crohn's disease. College Football USA 97 introduced Create a Player to the series and added a few more teams as Division 1A expanded to include Alabama-Birmingham, Boise State, Central Florida, and Idaho. Although there were other college football games out during these early years, no company challenged Electronic Arts in the 90s, more than 989 Studios and Sony. Due to an issue with Visual Concepts developing Madden 96 for Sony's PlayStation console, NFL Game Day was able to hit the PlayStation without worrying about competition from Madden. Those early adopters of the PlayStation who wanted a football game went with Game Day, and that was the start of one of the most short yet intriguing bouts in sports video game history. And along with an NFL game, 989 developed a college football game with their engine, entitled NCAA Game Breaker. NCAA Football 98 marked the first time the series was developed for Sony's PlayStation console, and it picked up a few significant upgrades along with its new engine. EA finally sprung for the official NCAA license, making NCAA Football 98 the first in a long line of games bearing that name. 98 also introduced a mode that would become a staple of the series, Dynasty Mode, although it was fairly limited at the time. The game was received generally well by critics, but the competition received slightly better reviews. NCAA Game Breaker 98 used NFL Game Day 98's engine, which meant all the player models were in full 3D. This made EA's football games look far inferior. For the 1998 season, NCAA Football 99 was able to sign a high-profile cover athlete in Charles Woodson. Woodson was, at times, seen as difficult to coach, but helped the Michigan Wolverines to a national championship and ended his college career winning the Heisman Trophy, becoming only the third Michigan player to win the Heisman, beating out Peyton Manning, Randy Moss, and Ryan Leaf in 1997. With a Heisman winner on the cover, EA acquired the license to the Heisman Trophy, and the trophy was represented in the game for the first time. More than 80 historical teams were added to the game, and the game was finally filling out with real-life college football atmosphere. But the biggest jump from 98 to 99 was the move to 3D polygonal graphics. While NCAA Game Breaker had a head start with the implementation of polygons, and while NCAA Game Breaker 99 was the better looking game, EA Sports was taking a shot at closing any and all gaps that 989 was trying to create. NCAA Football 2000 and Game Breaker 2000 continued to build upon what was becoming an impressive feature set and atmosphere for both games. NCAA Football scored the much better cover athlete when they signed Texas running back Ricky Williams. Game Breaker 2000 went with Cade McNown, who quickly became a bust in the NFL. By this time, the NCAA Football name was becoming stronger, and the early punch that 989 Studios had delivered was beginning to wear off. In the year 2000, we were introduced to new consoles with better technology, and 989 Sports was presented with an opportunity to potentially deliver a staggering blow to the NCAA football series. In October of 2000, Sony released the PlayStation 2 game console, and with 989 Sports developing strictly for Sony systems, they were able to get a head start on having Game Breaker ready to go by the end of the year. While EA Sports released Madden 2001 for PS2, even releasing a few days before the PS2 was available for purchase in North America, EA opted not to bring NCAA Football 2001 to the next-gen console. NCAA Football 2001 was released exclusively for the original PlayStation console, out of several football games that were released that year, including NCAA Game Breaker, Madden, NFL Game Day, NFL Quarterback Club, and NFL 2K1, NCAA Football 2001 was the worst-looking title of the bunch. 
However, due to the awkward transition many of these games experience from older consoles to the PS2, NCAA Football 2001 wasn't the worst overall. In fact, besides NFL 2K1, it was probably the best of the bunch. The Dynasty mode alone was about as deep of a mode you can get on consoles at the time. You could also create your own custom leagues, building your own conferences and putting together custom schedules. NCAA Football 2001 was also notable for being the last NCAA football game with the option to end the season with a 16-team playoff instead of using the BCS, which also made its debut in NCAA Football 2001. 2001 featured Alabama running back Sean Alexander on the cover, who was the first player to be on both the NCAA football and Madden covers, the only other player to do so being Larry Fitzgerald, who shared the cover of Madden 10 with Troy Palomalu. The head start for 989 Sports ended up being a disaster. While some reviewers cut some slack for the visuals and being the first year on a new platform, consumers hated it, and the story was no different for NFL Game Day. 2001 would be a rough year for 989 Sports, as NCAA Football 2002 made its debut on the PS2, and while it also suffered a lot from coming from the PlayStation to the PlayStation 2, the first year effort was still considered a better playing game than Game Breaker's first year effort. To make matters worse for 989, Sega released their first attempt at a college football game, titled NCAA College Football 2K2 Road to the Rose Bowl. The game featured Purdue quarterback Drew Brees on the cover and was released exclusively on the Dreamcast, but saw the NFL 2K engine being used, making it one of the best playing football offerings on the market. 989 Sports games continued to be heavily criticized, while each year, NCAA Football made small but effective updates to their titles. The gameplay of NCAA Football and Madden NFL continued to shed the stiffness that plagued it for years. Things got so bad for 989 Sports that NCAA Game Breaker 2002, which was to feature former Virginia Tech Hokie Michael Vick, was cancelled. Game Breaker would have two more games released, but would be cancelled completely along with NFL Game Day in 2004. 2K ceased making their college football game after only two years. NCAA Football and EA Sports stood atop the subgenre, winning a competition they didn't need to pay for to win, instead putting out a better overall product. NCAA Football 2003 would be the series debut on the Xbox and Nintendo GameCube platforms, and would begin to add back features it lost during the jump to the next-gen consoles. Create a school and dynasty mode were improved. NCAA Football 2004 improved on gameplay in a big way, and doubled down on bringing the college football atmosphere into your home. New introductions made schools and games feel different, and to this day, NCAA Football 2004 is still the favorite among many fans. In 2004, now with 989 Sports and everyone else out of the picture, EA continued to build on what they had, improving player models and presentation for NCAA Football 2005. This is also where the home field advantage feature debuted, making it more difficult for away teams playing in a raucous stadium to communicate pre-snap. Also included was the matchup stick, which allowed you to view player talent and age pre-snap, making the game more strategic for those who learn how to use it. NCAA Football 2005 was also packed in with the Xbox console for a while, getting the game in the hands of many who were new to the platform and those finally making the jump to newer consoles. EA Sports continued their role with NCAA Football 06, the first year that EA decided to shorten the year in the name of the title, something that would become the norm for the series till the end. But this was just the beginning of NCAA's new look, breaking the tradition of having a college player who was one year removed from playing in the NCAA, NCAA Football 06 put former Heisman Trophy winner Desmond Howard on the cover. Howard is seen striking the Heisman pose, and this was done to promote the game's new mode, Race for the Heisman. In Race for the Heisman, the player is tasked with taking an incoming college athlete from team workouts all the way to the top trophy in college football. You could read fan mail, opt to leave college before your senior year, and even have a heavy rotation of girlfriends as your career progressed. And once you left college, you could then port your player over to Madden 06's brand new Superstar mode to see his career continue on. Like NCAA Football 2004, 06 is the favorite of many NCAA football fans, and with very good reason. Around this time, the next console generation was kicking into gear. The Xbox 360 was out, and EA was quick to support the new platform with a completely different version of Madden 06. 
Much like the previous console generation, NCAA football was left to sit behind for a year, until NCAA football 2007. Unfortunately, much like the jump to the PS2 back in the early 2000s, the transition for football games to the 360 and PS3 were rough. While the games looked absolutely stunning, the gameplay was stiff and awkward. They also lacked the deep modes that were present in the last-gen versions. NCAA Football 07 on the original Xbox was a fantastic game, as it added even more to the career mode, but it no longer had the spotlight it once had, due to the attention the next-gen systems garnered. The version of NCAA Football 07 for the Xbox 360 was met with little fanfare and poor reviews. NCAA Football continued to struggle on the 360 and PS3 with NCAA Football 08. Once again, the graphics shined, but the gameplay continued to be stiff and the player models all looked far too big. EA Sports finally started to turn the corner, however, with NCAA Football 09, a game that saw a redo of the player models and a faster pace to gameplay. Modes were still an issue as the depth just wasn't there and many players just used the game to bring over the rosters to Madden 09. This is when rosters really started to get serious and when the trouble really started to heat up for college sports games. NCAA Football 09 featured an online roster sharing feature that allowed anyone to upload their custom rosters to a server and allowed anyone to download those files. Within the first few days of the game's release, real-world rosters were available to anybody, featuring the top names in college football. EA made it easier by making their default roster that was shipped with the game look similar to what the rosters for each team look like in real life. The problem was that EA wasn't paying anyone to do this, and skated around legal trouble by just listing the player's number, instead of including the actual names on the players. EA and other college games did this for years and years, but it really became a problem once games started to feature visual fidelity good enough for college athletes to make a serious argument in a court of law. Ed O'Bannon, a former basketball star at the University of California, Los Angeles, was at a friend's house one day where a game of NCAA basketball, published by EA Sports, was being played. O'Bannon recognized himself as a member of one of the classic teams featured in the game, and had not been compensated for his inclusion. For O'Bannon, enough was enough. In July 2009, Ed O'Bannon filed a lawsuit against the NCAA, Electronic Arts, and the Collegiate Licensing Company for violation of antitrust laws due to the use of college athletes' likenesses for commercial purposes. At this point, the talk of the end of college sports games began, and casted a cloud of doubt every year forward as to whether the NCAA football series would even continue. Around this time, the NFLPA and Players Inc. had just lost a $28 million lawsuit against retired NFL players who accused the parties of conspiring with Electronic Arts to use the players' likenesses for historical teams, leaving out the player's name to avoid compensation. Soon after, Brown's Hall of Fame running back Jim Brown brought a lawsuit against EA for the same accusation that would eventually settle for a reported $600,000. As the visual fidelity of video games became more and more impressive, so did the business of licenses and likenesses. In 2009, Sam Keller, a former quarterback for Arizona State and Nebraska, filed a similar lawsuit against EA and the NCAA, just two months before O'Bannon filed his. The main difference between the two suits is that Sam Keller's suit was focused on seeking damages for then-current and former college football athletes whose likenesses were used without compensation while O'Bannon's was focused on changing the strict rules for student-athlete compensation the NCAA had in place. Years went by and EA Sports continued to release NCAA football, improving the quality of the gameplay and presentation, but also continuing to use the likenesses of real college athletes. There was worry among fans that if EA didn't use those general likenesses, the series wouldn't sell enough copies to continue being produced. In 2011, big-time names like Bill Russell and Oscar Robinson joined the O'Bannon lawsuit and strengthened their support to have student-athletes be compensated for their likeness. Big money was being made, and student-athletes weren't seeing a cut of the profits. Some argued that their tuition was payment enough, and the debate of what student-athletes should be entitled to set the sports world ablaze. While other college sports games had dropped off due to poor sales, each year that NCAA football was released was like a miracle for the fans of the series. 
Through this time, NCAA football gained a reputation for being the game that instituted ideas and features that would later be used in Madden, sort of like the guinea pig for EA. NCAA Football 11 featured a new player movement system that made playing NCAA football far more fun than ever before. NCAA Football 12 was a slight but solid improvement on 11. As 2012 rolled around and everyone was awaiting the news on the lawsuit, EA Sports released NCAA Football 13, a game that disappointed many fans of the series. It seemed like the focus on 13 was to make the game simpler to play. EA Sports caught the backdraft of hardcore fans' ire when they approached Madden NFL 11 with the simpler, quicker, deeper marketing campaign that was really just simpler and quicker without the deeper part. With the thought that NCAA Football 13 could potentially be the last game in the series, the buzz was not good, and EA needed a strong rebound for 2013, if there was going to be a 2013 for the series at all. Development of NCAA Football 14 went on as planned, and a commitment was made to build on the presentation and dynasty mode sections of the game. Progress on the O'Bannon lawsuit was ramping up. Things were not looking good for the NCAA Football franchise. Not even given a chance to enjoy the success of NCAA Football 14, which was receiving high praise, the development leads and executives had to come up with a plan to keep the franchise going in the seemingly likely scenario that they would no longer have the licenses they'd had for the past 15 years, and also without illegally using college athletes' likenesses. On September 26, 2013, EA and the CLC settled with the plaintiffs for $40 million. The NCAA was no longer interested in working with EA, but EA could still produce a college football game without the NCAA license. All they had to do was individually contract each school, Knowing that they wouldn't be able to get every school that was previously in the game to agree to a deal, EA went after the bigger schools, and there were plans to make the next college football game extremely customizable. In an article written by Owen Good, then of Kotaku, Good asked NCAA football team member Alex Howell what their plans for the next game would have looked like. The article read, quote, What was going on with NCAA College Football 15? Howe says that he and Lore had, for a time, been working for a few years on a customization suite for the series that he believes would have gotten the green light in the coming title, which was to be developed for both the current console generation and the next generation. Howe, who speaks admiringly of Minecraft, Terraria, and other games with a heavy modification culture, said the idea was to turn the game over to fans, on the faith they know best what they most enjoy. Not only would that have entailed an overhaul of the existing customizer, Team Builder, which deals with single teams, the vision extended to things like stadium construction, layer editing for uniforms, and even D&D-like settings within the game's dynasty mode. For example, creating stories and occurrences elsewhere in the season, like a backup coming out of nowhere when a star performer goes down to injury, or a prestige team suffering a losing streak that upends the rankings at the end of the year. From the sounds of their vision, College Football 15 would have revolutionized sports gaming, and it would have been the first game in the series to reach the power of the PS4 and Xbox One consoles. But as the days went on, school after school declined to be a part of the game, fearing future legal ramifications. With very little support from the schools, no affiliation with the NCAA, and a game that sold a fraction of its big brother in Madden, EA decided it was time to shut down their college football series. After 20 years of battles, hits, and misses, a dedicated fanbase of college football video gamers was left without a new game to play each year. In the end, EA, the NCAA, and the CLC ended up paying out more than $60 million in the combined lawsuits over player likenesses. However, it seemed like many of the student athletes that received payment from this settlement were upset. They too grew up playing the NCAA football series, and a check for a few thousand dollars wasn't worth the death of a video game series they loved, a series they had good times and great memories with that money simply couldn't replace. The war between the compensation rights of student athletes and the NCAA's rules and opinions rages on, with nothing happening at the time of this video to suggest that college sports games will soon return. Will there ever be an agreement that can be reached to make everyone involved happy? I think we're still many, many years from figuring that out. 
and unfortunately, I think we're even longer away from seeing another NCAA football title. This is a story about loss. The loss of potential compensation of student athletes, the loss of a beloved video game franchise, the loss of those on the NCAA football team that were laid off by its cancellation. A game that has brought us a lot of loss has also brought us endless joy and entertainment. The NCAA football team gave us one last gift before they were forced to leave, NCAA Football 14, which is not only one of the best college football games ever made, it's also one of the best sports games, period. And for those of us who yearn to live in our own unique college football worlds, we'll continue to play it for as long as we can, until we once again have a college football game to look forward to. This was the legend of NCAA football.